So I'm going to introduce um, the team here and, uh, and the engineers that are going to talk tonight. Um, I, my name is Carl Quinn. I manage the engineering tools team here at Netflix. We handle a lot of the infrastructure and tooling for doing automated builds and deployments, uh, mostly for the cloud. We also support you know, different languages. The, Netflix itself is primarily a JVM-based um, you know, backend environment, so most of our code is in Java, but a lot of teams like to use different languages, and we do support freedom and responsibility across the team, so they can use whatever works for them. And a lot of the, the small projects use Grails and, and Groovy, but some of the more interesting um, higher performance alternate languages um, projects are being done in Scala. So there's a group four, three, three of you guys here are going to talk tonight about some of the interesting projects that we're doing. So first up will be Mark Ty. Thank you, Carl. So yeah, so this is, uh, I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, I know this is kind of a long way from where we usually meet, and it's actually really impressive that we got this much of a turnout all the way down at this end of the day. Um, just a quick agenda for the, the Netflix part of it. Um, uh, I'm going to talk about a couple of things, just to give a general overview. Uh, talk about a couple of projects I've been working on, then I'm going to turn it over to uh, Daniel, who is talking about a metadata service. And uh, Brian will talk about a project called Atlas, and then afterwards we'll take questions just about anything. Um, so to start, um, so this is the situation of uh, Scala Netflix. Uh, some of you kind of came up and asked about it uh, before the meeting. Uh, it's actually not huge just yet, but it is starting to gain some traction. Uh, depending on how you count sub-modules, sub-projects, you've probably got about five to seven Scala applications. Uh, nothing is really consumer facing yet, none of the things where you click the button and say I want to watch this or uh, redo my rate a movie or order my queue or anything like that. Uh, the scale is not showing up in that, it's mostly showing up uh, behind the scenes uh, in the infrastructure bits of things. Uh, so analysis and uh, monitoring is, is uh, where it's kind of raising its head in a, in a big way. Um, it's currently dwarfed, as Carl mentioned, uh, by Netflix has a rather sizable uh, inventory of, of hundreds of uh, applications and libraries that are written, uh, mostly in Java, a few other things. Uh, so why is there not more Scott? Um, part of it is the, the Netflix uh, freedom and responsibility culture, which has both a plus and a minus side to this <laughs> equation. Um, if you're not familiar with the Netflix freedom and responsibility, it's, uh, it's captured in this slide deck, uh, which is at SlideShare, which if you go to SlideShare and search freedom and responsibility, if you just go Google Netflix freedom responsibility, uh, it's a really interesting slide deck that was published internally as an HR document, it leaked out, and uh, when it did, uh, maybe about six years ago, we were like, we're actually not embarrassed about that, we actually were proud of this. So um, it describes Netflix's internal culture, which I won't, it's a whole other presentation in and of itself, but the, uh, the quick version is that there are two pillars, freedom and responsibility. We give our employees the freedom to do their job, to do it the right way, but of course that comes with the responsibility to do it the right way, to behave as adults, as our, as our head of HR person puts it. Um, and, and this influences pretty much every aspect of the company, but how it applies to this discussion and to software and architecture in particular is that, not architecture, uh, development, is that uh, Netflix doesn't have an architecture committee that says these are the four languages you're allowed to use and you're forbidden from using anywhere else or you know this is our application server you must use. Um, we, we trust our developers, we hire smart people, uh, we trust them to make sound technology decisions in ways that are both make sense for at the time and for future legacy purposes. Uh, so developers are free to use Scala or Python or Ruby or any other language um, if the benefits of doing so uh, justify the costs or any other uh, possible negative downside to it, you know, for that to be a learning curve or incompatibility, etc. Um, and truth be told, we um, 
we've had a lot of higher priorities to deal with over the last couple of years. Um, if you're not familiar with Netflix, we've done some really interesting things uh, from a software perspective. We've moved uh, from the data center uh, to the cloud, Amazon's cloud. That's been a huge re-architecture. We've done a lot of interesting things. Uh, some very interesting open source software has made itself out into the world and getting some press lately uh, to, to deal with that. Things like Asgard, Zookeeper, Curator, they've heard of. Uh, we've moved from a company that pretty much had pretty much one monolithic web app controlling everything into many granular web services. Again, these are all hosted in Amazon's cloud, so we have many independent web services talking to each other. Um, we've moved from having pretty much all of our data in a particular enterprise RM you know, a relational database uh, that happens to rhyme with Oracle. Um, <laughs> We've moved it to Cassandra, uh, open source, again, in the cloud. Um, uh, we've moved from a company that just did DVDs to uh, DVDs and streaming. Um, and we're moving from being a US only company, where we're well on the way, to uh, complete world domination. So, with all that on our plates, um, uh, adopting a new, a new JVM language, despite the uh, obvious productivity increases that, as scholarly users, we're all familiar with doesn't quite rise to the same level as some of all these. Uh, so that's where we're at right now. Uh, hopefully, as maybe things settle down, or as the benefits of Gala become more self-evident to uh, other teams in the company, uh, we'll build a bigger groundswell, and we'll see more scholar coming on Netflix. Um, so with that, I'm going to talk about uh, the first of the two projects that I've worked on here at Netflix. Um, it's called Scruffy. Um, what is Scruffy? Uh, Scruffy is a dependency browser. Specifically, it's a dependency browser for IV modules. Uh, IV is the system we use for organizing our dependencies between software modules. It's an alternative to Maven. Doesn't do some of the things that Maven does, but it, it provides a certain flexibility that Maven lacks. Uh, and we like it because it has that flexibility. Um, so, so why do we need a dependency manager? Well. Um, this is a little screenshot uh, from our, our Artifactory instance. Artifactory is our ID repository where all of our software modules get published to and where we pull them all from. Uh, it claims to be happily serving more than 100,000. It actually wasn't nearly as happy as it claimed to be. Um, it, was, it was getting a little bit, a little bloated. Uh, we had a terabyte of disk filling up. We were losing backups. Performance was degrading. Uh, and that meant that every build was slowing down because it would have to do resolution. Um, so that was that was not so good. And, and, and why was it loaded? Well, um, a, a typical Netflix project will get republished as it iterates through versions. We like to iterate through software quickly here and get features out rather than you know, having a long branch building. So anyway, it's, it's more adaptive to get things built quickly. Um, but as you would do so, you would leave versions behind and, and a typical Netflix project. This is a little historical, this slides out of date, but you know, it could accumulate dozens or even hundreds of artifacts, most of which are, are not needed anymore. I mean, the, the current leading edge of the projects would have dependencies, would tend to depend on the more recent stuff. So would, would we just delete all the old stuff? Uh, it wasn't as simple as that. Uh, the, the highly active projects would iterate very quickly. They could do one, uh, more than one release a day. Um, but there would be stable projects that would just arrive at a point where they had delivered all the functionality that they needed, and months would pass between releases. They just didn't need new features. So any cleanup strategy that was just based on age uh, would very easily delete older artifacts that were actually still being dependent on. So we, we had to do something a little bit smarter. Uh, to determine which ones could be safely deleted, uh, we needed a tool that would analyze the dependency relationship between these IV modules. Uh, and the IV modules, uh, you know, that didn't, nothing currently dependent on were candidates for deletion. Uh, and that's where Scruffy came in. Um, so how does it work? Um, it, it downloaded the IV module descriptors from the Artifactory repositories. Uh, since RV is our, Artifactory is our ID repository, every <coughs> module that gets published has a little ID file. Um, I used to have a slide up, but nobody likes looking at XML. Um, that, that basically describes the contents of the module, its dependencies, and what it depends on, what it, and what dependencies or what artifacts it produces that you can then depend on yourself. 
uh, Scruffy would then parse these module descriptors into a huge dependency graph, basically analyzing the relationship between all these. And then uh, it would uh, render the view of this graph um, through a variety of interfaces. Um, as a, just a point of curiosity, it wound up um, being more effective to just build the whole thing in memory uh, rather than trying to deal with uh, backing this with a relational database or experimenting with graph databases. Um, so it just grabs all the descriptors, assembles the graph, and keeps it in memory. Uh, it builds up a significant memory footprint, but it had really, really good response times. So that was a nice side effect of that. Um, the graph is immutable, uh, so that's another nice factor. And it only needs to be rebuilt twice an hour, so the cycling in and out of the memory doesn't really matter so much. Um, and that's because we just pull our factory for the new ID data every hour. Uh, so, so what can it do? Um, a couple of main features. It's just got a nice, uh, the, the actual web API or the web interface has a nice hierarchical navigation. Has specialized query pages for types of things that might be interesting and uh, REST API. Um, hierarchical navigation that basically presents a hierarchy of uh, the full dependency graph all the way down from the top level through organization, through module, through version. It's a scheme that will be familiar to you if you've probably worked with either Maven or IB or probably other dependency schemes and other types of software. Uh, so basically, like all these URLs here just convert into a page with data on it. I don't have that particular level of resolution. Um, each view displays next links to the next level down, right comes going back up. The bottom level, you know, basically a version, a particular version of the module displays. Scruffy BIS basically just tries to give you all the data it possibly can about a given version. Its names, its locations, where to find it in the repository, how to link it back to the build, where it was built, uh, where the source code comes from, et cetera, et cetera. Um, statistics about how it's downloaded, metadata, um, and of course the ever important uh, dependencies. Uh, things that it depends on and the dependence of things that depend on it. Just about everything is in link. Uh, there's also some query pages. Basically aggregate lists of modules by certain criteria that turn out to be interesting for this use case, like basically saying, what are the modules that have been produced but have never been downloaded? Uh, if, if they've never been downloaded, that means that they've never been considered for inclusion in the build, so they're effectively useless. Or what are the ones that have uh, not been downloaded in X number of days or N number of days. Um, and this type of sort of uh, you know, flexible query functionality is replicated in the REST API um, with, with similar criteria. So you can say, oh, last downloaded by a certain number of days, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, I've been breezing through these slides. This was actually from an uh, internal presentation I gave here about how to use it. Uh, this is the part that's more interesting to the, uh, the external uh, group. Um, so, so what makes Scruffy go? And of course, since we're here, it's, it's all Scala. Um, it's Scala, it's Lyft, it uses the Bootstrap CSS framework, it uses the uh, Dispatch um, DSL for each client, uh, Jetty, SBT, and Scala test. Um, like I said, it's written entirely in Scala. Uh, Scala is great because it makes complicated things really easy. Uh, that and the other way around too. Uh, <laughs> not, not usually. Not usually. I'm thinking of some other language. Um, so okay, this actually comes out in the slide. I wasn't sure if it was uh, this would be legible. This is actually the entirety of uh, the dependency graph for Scruffy. And what's you know, it's not necessarily going to be intelligible if you're not familiar with it. But the, the whole idea is. If you're somewhat familiar with Scala, is you basically this is a trait, so you'd layer it on an implementation, and then, so you'd have to have an implementation that would actually satisfy that method at the top, which just gives you a, 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 an iterable of descriptors, these module descriptors I referred to. It's not the actual XML, but a, an object representation of them. And then those actually come from somewhere else. But once you get that iterable of descriptors, this just gives you a really nice way of basically saying uh, it just just layer all this in a way that, that organizes it. So it's like, eh, you've got a couple of fine methods that will just filter the descriptor based on whether they match certain criteria, like whether they match, the word name rather than word name. But this is basically matched by, by name, or it's like, uh, you know, 
Does it, does, it, does it satisfy this dependency or does it depend on something else? Uh, the three infos by methods uh, basically take the hierarchy of, of, uh, of iterable descriptors and basically organize them and say, okay, we'll build a tree, build a map between organization and everything else, and then you take those and sort them into another one. So basically with just a handful of methods, uh, you've built a really in huge, you know, really nice in-memory structure that can just be queried to find anything. Um, and I, I just can't imagine if I had to write this in Scala. I mean, in Java or, or other. <laughs> <laughs> I had somebody write this for me in Scala. You know, um, you know just uh, in Scala, this would be, uh, it'd, it'd be this. But in Java, so, <laughs> in Java so frequently, I don't even use the word anymore. So it doesn't, it doesn't all the time. In, in Java, this would be even more difficult. Um, hundreds of lines of code? Uh, I, I honestly don't, don't know at this point. There's a lot. Well, yeah, I mean, the, group, the grouping, the um, being able to provide a default value to a group by or to a map, I mean, all of these these uh, functional, you know, I mean, the, this thing of finding a releases. So you take your infos, turn it into a sequence, you flap it, you, go, you, you, you flat map it, see if it's a release, you turn that back into a sequence, you sort it by version and reverse. I mean, that's actually fairly, I mean, without knowing a whole lot about this code, you could probably figure out what that method does. And you don't even need comments. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't take any out. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, so so really, this this could be some very very complicated code in another language. You can Scala it, it, it pretty much. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's really straightforward. Um, so that's just the raw Scala aspect of it. And there's not all of the not all the aspects of it are this neat, but I haven't polished them as much as this. Um, so uh, Scruffy is also built upon Lyft. Uh, Lyft, uh, I, was, I was trying to come up with a good metaphor to describe Lyft. Um, and I, I was torn between a, 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 a musty used bookstore and a fabulous junk shop. The, the used bookstore is a little, implies a little ancientness to Lyft, which isn't really true. It's, it's very cutting edge. Um, but, but it just does have this random, everything that the kitchen sink approach to features. Uh, which are great, and they're fantastic ideas. Uh, I mean, it's very much sort of an agglomerative web framework that decided to steal the best ideas from everything from Rails to Seaside to Wicked to, you know, just if there was a web framework out there that had a good idea, the designers of Lyft said, yeah, we'll steal that, and we'll make it all work together. Um, and, and they are well implemented. It's not, it's not you know, not kind of a, just a, a sandbox or an experiment that doesn't really, it performs, it, it holds together. Um, if we go to liftweb.net later, can we see a quote from you? Fabulous junk shot at <laughs> the web framework? Oh. They have quotes from people, they have endorsements. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, it's a fabulous in full. You might want to say curiosity shop. Ah, there you go. Treat me rather than like a junkyard dog. Yeah. yeah. Um, maybe, maybe that's a particularly Midwestern definition of a junk drop that doesn't really translate. But um, yeah, so so there's some other great things about you know, it, and it does have a very friendly, responsive community. Um, especially if you have a new feature you want added to it, um, <laughs> they will put it in there. They will not, uh, they will probably not say no if it is a great idea and well implemented. Uh, they're also pretty good to get help from. Uh, which is fortunate because the, the, the next point is not so good. The, the documentation is kind of scattershot and consistent. It's not really clear where to go for a definitive answer to anything. Um, and, and you really won't get too far without having to read the source code, which is an education in itself. Uh, if, if Play 2.0 had been released a year earlier, it may have gone that way with Scruffy, but it's written in Lyft, and I'm, I'm pretty happy with that. Um, it also uses Bootstrap, which is not exactly Scala specific, but uh, I just want to put in a plug for it. Uh, this is a CSS framework that came from Twitter. You've probably seen it now, even if you don't realize it. Um, everything. It's whoa. Just on. There we go. Um, it, it makes it uh, really easy to make a, a good-looking, make a website that looks like you know what you're doing. 
uh, when it comes to design, even if you don't, which I don't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you should, you should really try it out. Um, you, you really no longer have any skills for the website to be the guideline. Um, it wasn't directing specifically. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> um, uh, Dispatch. Dispatch is a, is a clever little DSL uh, that came, uh, it's actually written by uh, Nathan Hamlin of, uh, of Meetup, actually. Um, and and it, it's a wrapper around the well-known and well-used, if not loved, uh, Apache HTTP client library. Uh, so, so this is, you know, this is what you sort of get to just grab the Apache homepage and dump it out uh, to system out in, um, in, the, in, the, in the dispatch DSL. Uh, that's not too bad. Um, to do it actually in Apache HTTP client, that is effectively the same code. Um, that's no fun. Uh, that's really not something you should really, you know, have to do if all you want to do is just grab a URL and just grab the content. I mean, that's effectively a curl command. So um, it, uh, Scruffy pulls all of its its uh, data from Artifactory and grabs it as either XML or JSON. And having this library internally to kind of call out to other APIs makes that much more fun and Scala-like than this sort of stuff. Um, Scruffy uses Jetty, uh, which is a bit of deviation. We tend to use Tomcat at Netflix. Um, you know, but there's a bit of a good reason for doing that. Uh, Jetty supports continuations, which are not yet available in Tomcat 6, which is the flavor we use around here. Um, without continuations, uh, Tomcat uses locks to provide comment support. Um, and comment is a uh, kind of an advanced non-polling Sort of wizardry for for uh, interaction at, a, at the at the Ajax level on, between a browser and a, and a backend web server. Basically, it's, it's it implements a push from server to the browser. Um, really, really nice stuff. Not an essential feature, but you don't want to use locking to do it. So, um, uh, Scruffy's built with SBT, the simple build tool, uh, which is written in Scala itself and tends to be, I think, the default. Scala build tool at this point, uh, although there are exceptions. People are still building a lot of stuff with Maven. Um, but uh, SPT, with SPT, if you haven't used it, your build configuration can either be in a Scala DSL or just in plain Scala code, uh, which gives you type safety and compile checking of your build configuration. Uh, just try that with Ant, or, or I should have said, I should have picked on Ant with Maven. You can't do that with Maven either. Um, it, it really makes for kind of an elegant. Um, uh, build system, uh, and this is Scruffy's build file. Uh, it's, it's pretty simple, uh, even with some extra junk sort of added in to make it Netflix specific. Um, just really, really nice. You just kind of do some. That's the DSL version as opposed to the raw Scala version. Um, I use Scala test uh, the vector of which is somewhere there. There, no. the author of Scala test. Um, uh, it's it's not the only Scala testing framework, but I like it because it, it's really the most flexible one. It doesn't really prescribe any particular way of testing. If you like to do it JUnit style, or if you like to do behavior-driven development, uh, you want to do assertions or handcuffs matchers, um, it's your choice. This slide is actually a couple months old. It was probably true to form. If I probably went out to Scala test right now, I would discover that Bill has added some new feature that I that, that happens every time I go to the web, Scala test website looking for documentation. I discover, oh my god, there's something new here. Never quite keep up with it. I don't know how he writes it fast for Donnie Lennon. Um, so yeah, there's some there's some tests in uh, Scala test. That's just what did I wind up using for that? Is that uh, that's ham pressing. So that's kind of be a little BDD. Real tests from uh, so just to test the XML stuff. Um, uh, one last slide I threw in here. Oh, that last slide, last scruffy slide. Um, just for uh, just to get in another plug. Um, in my current development environment, I use JRebel. JRebel turns out to be maybe not essential, but really a wonderful addition for uh, web application development with Scala and Lyft. 
If you're not familiar with J Rebel, it's a um, it's a product from Zero Turnaround that does some class loader voodoo I don't understand, but it reloads, recompiled classes in the JVM while it's running. Um, they offer a free license for Scala users if you want to use JRebel. It works fine for Java 2, but you have to pay for that. They can make the same thing available for free for Scala users. Uh, you put Eclipse and JRebel and SBT together and you get amazing productivity and web application development. This is basically set up JRebel to look for wherever Eclipse is compiling your classes to. You have SBT set to run the Jetty web app with your application. You can basically type in changes in your IDE, save the file. Um, Eclipse will compile it, save it off. Uh, JBubble will pick it up. And probably before you can tab over to the browser and reload the page, the changes will have already been there. And so it's, it's like you're, you might as well be using Rails or something. It's just completely dynamic. You never know you were using a statically typed, compiled language for web development. Uh, it's not perfect, of course. You'll eventually get a perm gen error. You'll always run out of perm gen. But, um, but it reduces the need for redeploys by like, like a factor of like one out of 20 instead of having to redeploy. Every time you make a change, it's every 20th change or even less frequently. Um, so what's next for Scruffy? Uh, one of the big features that people want to add is a more graphical visualization uh, with the D3 JavaScript library. More ID info, a richer REST API, more uh, people want to do more aggressive or more intricate types of calls against it. And uh, there's been talk about open sourcing it. Um, so that may be on the horizon as well. Um, so that's it for Scruffy. Uh, now I'm going to talk a little bit about Adara, uh, which is an SVT plugin uh, for Netflix projects. Uh, it has a couple features which I'll talk about, including um, dynamic module versioning, uh, manifest menu units, status for publishing. It probably doesn't make much sense too, but I'll go through each of those in sequence. Um, <coughs> why, why plugins for SVT? Uh, SVT is a great tool. It has a lot of features that just sort of work with little or no configuration right out of the box. Dependency you know, all those. Dependencies, compile, Scala doc, Scala doc, uh, testing, packaging, publishing, even execution. There's, there's more, but, um, you know, compared to what you need to do to actually get it going compared to, say, an AMP project or Maven or something like that, it's, it's kind of nice how sort of just conventional SDT is. But um, it doesn't do everything. Uh, there's probably a good reason why it shouldn't do everything. I don't know why you want to build a tool that could build everything. Um, but it's extensible to fill in the gaps. Uh, so some of the open source SVT plugins we use are the uh, XSVT web plugin and the native packager. Uh, the web plugin is pretty much essential if you're going to be developing a web project with SVT. It, it packages a WAR, which is surprisingly not a native feature out of SVT. Uh, and it also has an embedded Jetty web server, so it actually allows you to launch a test web server right from the SVT console, which is really nice for the type of productivity I just mentioned earlier with Scruffy. Just launch the web server with the one line command. It's reloading the code. You see the, you know, there's no deployment cycle during your, your build and test process. And um, here at Netflix, we, because of our sort of cloud deployment feature, we basically, the way we package up applications when they go off to the cloud, we turn them into Red Hat RPMs. Uh, so we use the SVT native packager to basically take WAR files and package them with some Tomcat configuration or a miscellaneous configuration and basically use that as our deployment tool. And uh, the native packager, which is I believe by Josh Shereff out of TypeSafe, does a really nice job on that. Um, but that doesn't take care of everything. Um, there's a couple things like the uh, existing Netflix um, CBF, which stands for Common Build Framework, uh, which is what we use to build all of our legacy projects. That's what we really are the vast majority of our code base, uh, is, is ant-based. And it has a, a fair amount of sophisticated functionality built into it, uh, most of it added by Carl. Um, and one of the things that we do uh, is it, uh, it determines the project number, or the, the, the version number of a project, 
uh, by going out to Artifactory, where we have deployed our libraries, uh, finding the most recent release, and then incrementing that. So there's no there's none of this what you get with some other projects where you have to say, oh, I you know want to release my project, and I released it again, but I forgot to increment the version number, so now there's two versions of 1.4, and which jar is it? To kind of sidestep that manual process, we, we sort of have stuff built into the framework that does that automatically. And um, basically, to do stuff in, in SBT, we wanted to do that same functionality since SBT does it that way as well. Um, turns out there was a bit of a conundrum in how to do that in SBT. Uh, if you're not familiar with SBT, um, everything in SBT is either a setting or a task. A setting is pretty much what you might guess it is. It's a property of some sort. It can be a string value, int value, but it's it's set. Once it, you can you can use settings to determine other settings, you can glue together parts of it to create another setting. But once they are set, they are basically idempotent. That is their value. It's kind of determined when the build is bootstrapped and that's what they are from then on. A task is something that happens in SPT. So I don't know, it's, a, it's a compilation, or it's a generation of Javadoc, or it's even just a matter of going out and retrieving a file. But tasks are non identitant You can compile and then compile again. And then, you know, the two compilation steps will produce different output. Because if you just compiled and the classes are still there, you shouldn't need to compile as much. Um, so tasks can depend, obviously, on both settings. You have to tell how things have to happen. Obviously, the output of other tasks can determine tasks, but um, you know, but they, again, they produce non-identical output. Uh, the consequence of this, uh, much labored expression, is that settings can't depend on tasks. Uh, you can't have something that is identical depend on something that can produce different results with each. Uh, and, and the reason why this matters is that in, in SBT, the project version is a setting. So therefore, it's identical. It's typically set in a build file at the beginning of the build. You give it a value and say, my version is 1.0.0, and that's it. Um, we like to do stuff. We need to go out, use IV to go out to Artifactory and retrieve the version number and then increment it. IV can only be accessed via a task. Uh, so this is a bit of a dilemma. Um, the solution was not pretty, but it basically involved overriding an SBT module settings task to have it kind of create a fake ID module with the next version number. That version number is determined by using SBT's actual own internal ID instance to go resolve, as if it was trying to pull in that dependency, but it just sort of grabs it, parses the result, increments it, and, and substitutes those results for the what would have been the original module settings. It's, uh, Certainly not pretty, but I, it works, uh, and it does what we need it to do. Um, the other things that our own custom uh, SBT plugin do is they're a fair bit more uh, uh, straightforward. Um, one that I think is we, uh, we like to cram as much uh, metadata into our both the published modules, ID file and the manifest file of the jar. Uh, as we can just for troubleshooting purposes so that we can go back and look at a jar and basically see where did this come from, how was it built, etc. So that's you can see the list of the data that we put in there, build information, source control, you know, bug ID, and even a list of jars that were on the class path when the, when the jar of the war file was built. Um, producing a manifest in SBT or adding to the content of the manifest is actually relatively straightforward. You just override the ID module and the package option tasks and, and get the metadata from you know, all these things that are basically floating around uh, in the SBT environment. Um, the third thing we needed uh, our, our Scala projects to do in order to make them compatible with sort of the Netflix way of doing things is, is sort of, we have our slightly different way of publishing things. Um, SBT's sort of out-of-the-box publishing strategy is a little Maven-centric. It assumes you either have a single repository where everything goes to, or maybe you have kind of a dichotomy of a snapshot repo or a release repo. Um, Netflix actually uses, has three different release statuses, a snapshot, candidate, and release. So candidate's kind of an intermediate pre-release phase. Uh, but each of those goes into its own repository, and uh, that's not complicated enough. We actually keep them separate. We have each of those three statuses for libraries and a separate set of 
uh, repositories for applications, so a total of six. Um, I won't go through this, but this is just sort of the general idea. Uh, we have source code coming from Force, we build stuff with Jenkins, we pull dependencies out of Artifactory, and then when they publish, they go back in. That's what you do for libraries, and then applications do the same thing, except they get published the apps, and then they get turned into those RPMs I was talking about, uh, packaging up, and then into Asgard, our Amazon Web Services console management tool. Um, so we could hack up these six different repositories just by putting the right setting in the build file and then changing it before and after publishing a release, but that gets into the whole problem I described earlier of like, oh shoot, I forgot to change the, the version number or the setting status you know, before the release. So uh, it turns out with SBT it made it, it wasn't that hard to add new tasks that, uh, that parallel SBT's existing deliver and publish tasks. So you just have a deliver candidate and publish candidate and same thing for release in the default. Uh, just produce the snapshot. Um, so that pretty much brings what we do with SBT kind of up to speed with, with the kind of the custom stuff that we do on our own existing and build framework. And, um, you know, it was kind of interesting getting into the world of SBT plugin development. Um, you know, I found that the difficulty of writing a plugin for SBT varies a lot depending on exactly what you're trying to do. Um, there are certain aspects of SBT where it's clear that the functionality was meant to be extended, uh, like creating new op options for packaging. And there's nice extension points and you just override things and things happen quite easily. Um, Anything related to Ivy or module dependency resolution or you know, publishing itself wasn't too bad. But there's definitely anything related to Ivy resolution, configuration, just anything to do with Ivy is, is pretty hard. Um, and, and understanding the inner workings of SBT is really the hard part. The, the documentation on the wiki gets you going. Um, the code itself is pretty amazing, but it is uh, it leverages some of the more advanced wizardry aspects of Scala to do stuff. Um, trying to figure out how it's doing what it's doing it's, 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 can be quite tricky. But once you have figured that out, writing the code itself is actually um, fairly easy. And um, with that, I, that's my last slide. That's the Q&A at the end. But in the meantime, um, who's going next? JSON blog that gets, uh, it needs to be uh, searchable uh, across different attributes. And so we have a few uh, building blocks. So the idea is build something relatively quickly that can sustain certain uh, patterns of use. And in this case, these were more or less the requirements. So, uh, Full index support on all attributes from the document and being able to handle um, rich queries. So it could be an exact match. This field has this value. It could be a regular expression match. A uh, range query of this particular number is between these two values or a combination of them uh, using Boolean uh, 
queries that can or not. At the same time, we also needed to be obviously a highly available system, so we could lose a certain number of machines and continue working. And and um, feature for certain deployments is that, for example, uh, this is mainly used for a monitoring uh, system where we have an influx of metrics, and metrics is a uh, set of keys and values. For example, name is a value, a cluster is these particular values. And sometimes we get uh, probably hundreds of thousands of metrics that are never ever used again. So they are set ones, never read. So ideally we would like to expire uh, a new document after a certain period of time. So document oriented uh, in this case is something like we have a, in this case uh, for one of the monitoring system uh, atlas that we're going to talk about later the metric is just a simple uh, map of strings to strings but for other tools that we use which have more complicated structures uh, in this case uh, one of the tools that we use to um, basically cache certain AWS objects has, uh, in this case, security groups, which in itself is another, is an array of certain other attributes. And this can be uh, arbitrarily nested. So we want to be able to say, find all machines that have a security group, group name, in one of these values, for example. Uh, and then perform certain calculations. So the motivation for writing this from scratch, and why not use something that is already written, is uh, mainly because, well, first we tried. <laughs> it, it was all it was a lot simpler to just try to use uh, a JSON-oriented uh, NoSQL store. But we ran into different products. Uh, in particular, some of them could not handle a high number of writes and at the same time serve reads. So they had one of them had a global log on the whole uh, server. So it would block all reads as long as there was one writer. So the writer would block the entire database. And we, and we could scale that. It, it would work fairly well until you had about three to 5,000 uh, writes per second. But uh, once we try to push that to the tens of thousands of writes per second, uh, the percentage of time that we spent in just log contention was in the high, 90, high 90s. So it was operations that used to take around one to five milliseconds were taken in the seconds range. Um, so that had to go. Uh, um, also, other tools have uh, particular problems in terms just of uh, simple operability issues, like being able to upgrade the cluster, right? Running from one version to upgrade to a different version if there are incompatibilities there, or if we need to add more capacity, like add more shards. What's the procedure when once you lose the configuration of how the shards are handled, uh, or which pieces of data go into each shard? And how well does it handle backups and restore if it has a notion of snapshots and being able to serve load while you have a snapshot load uh, taken? And so we built our own, and it's fairly straightforward, mainly because all of these components were already there for the most part. So uh, Netflix uh, uses Cassandra very extensively, and we have very good uh, client library that, that's open source. Um, that's supported by a central team that takes care of all the availability issues and keeps track of upgrading Cassandra or installing or adding capacity. So that's nice to have as a solved problem. And then we also have uh, Zookeeper that's central uh, to the company. And we have an open source library as well for uh, high level constructs on top of Zookeeper, in this case we use the master selection. So each, uh, so the way this works is many requests come to a set of proxy machines. Uh, if it's a query, 
the proxy sends the query to one of each uh, replica set. So the replica set will handle a certain uh, range of the, uh, so we, we hash them, uh, the document, and a certain uh, range, MD5 range, will be handled by a particular shard. So in this case, the proxy for a query will send it to all shards and then merge the results. Um, um, writes go to all machines, but only the master for the shard will write to Cassandra. And as they are receiving the metrics, they are updating a, a local uh, Lucy index. And we have multiple uh, indexes at the same time. In certain cases, when we are upgrading or we are behind. Um, and the good thing is that all of these components um, were using for Java libraries so that uh, Netflix provides. So we have a fairly extensive platform library. And let's, the, the thing with this the system is that they will always fail. So we need to deal with what happens when um, indexer is having issues and the proxy, does the proxy retry, does it not retry, does it black, uh, blacklist the slow machine, does it start sending uh, the queries to the next server, um, what happens when we do an upgrade and we need to replace a set of indexers, uh, but we need to replace them with a set of machines that is different in size from the previous version. And we have Chaos Monkey, so that's the toy that it tends to cause these failures on purpose. So it will kill these machines on purpose to see how we react to them. So pretty much all our systems need to be chaos aware, especially new systems. Um, so all of these high-level features were available. So writing the, the code for the specific logic, it was just a matter of, uh, OK, so how does using work, and how does Zookeeper and Cassandra for this work, and the hard problems of retries, blacklisting, uh, those are all already taken care of. And why Scala for this particular project, mainly because it integrates extremely well with Java libraries. So using Java libraries from Scala is extremely easy. And it's very, very concise, so we can write code very quickly. Um, and a personal taste, it, people either really enjoy the static typing or they prefer a more dynamic language. But in Scala's case, Static typing doesn't usually have the cost usually associated with uh, being explicit about the types. The type difference in Scala works very, very well. So you get the benefit of static typing, and when you're writing some high-level functions, um, you will probably get a compile error if, you, if your logic is wrong. So that's very good. And being able to just modify data that's immutable by default with high-level functions like <coughs> map, flat map, filter, group, contains partition. The Scala collection library is really, really good. And uh, we get a lot of functionality just by, by default. And in this particular case, where we are usually just transforming certain data structures from one domain to the other, having base classes and pattern matching is, is very, very helpful. And something that is probably good to learn quickly if you're new to Scala is how to use the reference for experimentation. It's extremely easy and if you couple with uh, couple the REPL with JRevel that will reload uh, modified classes as you're writing code. So if you have an editor window and then uh, you modify and you have a <coughs> to the compiling SVG that's automatically compiling change file, JRevel will automatically reload it and you can just keep playing on the on the REPL as you're writing your code. Very, very productive. And this is an example of how we are transforming uh, a simple query. So we have this high-level trait query, uh, and then we need to produce a using query. And Scala makes it extremely easy to extract. So we have particular classes that are uh, queries, equal query, regex query, and queries, and we have all queries and all. And transforming them, these three level and these three like data structures where in this case, uh, for example, an unquery can have 
two subqueries, it's very, very easy to read and to write. So uh, Scala in this case is uh, one of the better choices, especially in the JVM space. Um, but sometimes um, we need to be aware of certain, especially for performance critical code, that um, this is a benchmark I wrote very quickly, so as all benchmarks is definitely going to be controversial or wrong, or both. <laughs> but uh, in this case, I was testing two approaches. One was just a functional style where I have a function that takes an integer and it needs to return a list of integers, right? Um, and all our APIs work much, much better if you send batches. So Scala has this grouped, uh, the collection library has a grouped and, uh, method that takes a number, an integer, and it will return uh, a list of those up to that size chunks, right? So we send those in parallel to a function that will return a map, and then we just concatenate the map together. So it's fairly straightforward Scala code. But the imperative style of writing that code um, is we have a concurrent map, and then we just pass that map, which is updated by all the different threads at the same time. So it's, it does the same thing, except in one case, we are taking the subcomputations and concatenating them all together. But in this case, uh, we just pass it, and it's updated by uh, all the different threads. I should note that that dot par is doing things in parallel. It's kind of it's very good for like these quick uh, tests. So the numbers I got for for this, when the function is consistently, the imperative way is consistently faster. So it's lower numbers in, in the microsecond range are. Uh, but for the most part, I would say for 99% of the code uh, I write, it doesn't make any difference. So just having something that is obvious and works is much, much better than having something that might or might not say 60 microseconds here or there. So, but for certain uh, very uh, performance critical code, is you sometimes have to rewrite your functional code that's very easy to read into this more complicated to reason about uh, imperative style code. This is another uh, example. So when once you're dealing with machine, you usually deal with these bit sets. And in this case, um, I'm just adding a random number to the bit set, which could be the document ID that we just got. And I'm using here a mutable bit set from the Scala collection library. Um, just to say something, I need to traverse all of, over all of the documents I did that were, were added there and just complete the sum, just a random example. So the dot sum does everything I need uh, I need to do, so it's obvious, it's obvious that it's right. So the, the answer I'm getting is going to be right. But if I were to rewrite this in a more imperative style, the second part is basically doing the same thing I was doing with one line of Scala code. Well, here I'm doing it using uh, Java util bit set. And it, this is not obvious, that's right. So this needs to be accompanied by a certain set of unit tests. But once you have the unit test and you're sure that this is right, did it make sense to rewrite it in this more definitely more complicated and more difficult to reason uh, about way. And sometimes it does. So for example, when the maximum document ID was one million, so the size of the your bit set was relatively small, Java and Scala were basically the same. So in this case, no, this, that was rewriting that simple code into this more complicated code was not right. But if we go to a billion documents, which is a rough, it's a good approximation for the number of documents we can handle in one shard. We go from the nanosecond, the nanosecond time to three seconds. 
So what happened there? And that's why you still need to start to drilling down into why, <coughs> how certain things work. It's usually good. So in the case of the dot sum, uh, that's implemented with the Swiss Army knife of functional programs, default uh, functions, so it's the fold left, and then fold left is implemented as for each, and then you go to the code and you read this in the Scala collection library. And it seems fairly straightforward, right? So if you're new to Scala, uh, it might not be obvious why that's so slow, but the zero until n words, that's creating a new uh, range <coughs> object. And range objects are very efficient, but the second uh, loop, the 4J, is creating a new range object. And it's doing that for every iteration of the loop. So once you have a lot of documents, n words is going to be relatively large, so you're going to generate a lot of garbage. So the three seconds is obviously because garbage collection was kicking in and was certainly uh, slowing down the whole process, which should have been a lot simpler. So because a range is an object, rewriting this particular inner loop as a while loop, just with a uh, variable, uh, would have gotten rid of all these unnecessary objects and made the code significantly faster especially once you go past a certain number. So uh, one thing, for example, I was looking at the, at the profiler, just trying to understand why the code was slow. And you can see the number of objects that were range objects was significantly high. It was 93% of all the objects I had at that point. So, uh, but those are very rare cases. For the most part, uh, just getting the productivity boost from using the collections library is, is a huge benefit. Um, is it that's it. Uh, any questions? Yes. Scala two nine. Scala two nine two. Uh, two nine one and two nine two. I tested both. Yeah. Why do you need um, metadata service if you have Zookeeper? So the metadata service uh, is receiving roughly, uh, I want to say, about a million uh, writes per second. And these are um, different entities. So Zookeeper is basically a low level set of primitives for writing distributed systems. And the Z-node abstraction in Zookeeper is not meant to be abused with more than, let's say, 30,000 or so Z-nodes, and you get into trouble. And also, it's extremely slow to write to Zookeeper because Zookeeper, as you have more machines in your uh, Zookeeper cluster, each of them needs to write, because this is reliable, whatever the state of the world is to disk, and it's commit that. And once you have a quorum with Zookeeper servers, then the transaction is done. So, Zookeeper is relatively slow, especially when compared to systems like Cassandra. In Cassandra, writes are extremely fast because all the writes go to memory. And that's it. It doesn't commit anything, and it relies on other <coughs> nodes on if you need high availability. You just set the consistency level high. So for example, for updates that are important, uh, you set the consistency level of quorum, or local quorum, and then more than a few machines have this, the updated object in memory. And the way Cassandra works is then flashes those mem tables to disk, but writes are extremely fast. So you, you're usually, we're, we're sending batches of roughly 256 updates to Cassandra, and it writes those 256 nodes. So I get the answer back in under a under millisecond. It sounds like you like to start out in a functional style and then move to a period when we're forced to do so. Okay. Uh, in your experience, have you had much um, you know, friction in making that move? Uh, you know, in general, we you move to the imperative coding style uh, 
without having to re re architecture your application? That's a good question, but uh, no, for the most part, it's really isolated <coughs> function. So we, as long as you structure the code in a certain way, it's usually very isolated. So you can identify, uh, and only have to run under a profiler. So once you know that there's an issue that can be solved by rewriting the code, uh, then you do it. But it's usually not the problem as long as you have very isolated components. Yes? Cassandra, this might not be a scholarly question, but I'm curious anyhow, when you write all of these uh, you know, billions of um, records to Cassandra, do you actually incur operational costs like, you know, factions and, uh, you know, data inconsistencies or schema changes? So could you uh, share a little bit about what are the key uh, operational overheads that you guys have run into? Cassandra, or have you run into that? Yeah, that's fairly specific to Cassandra, but, uh, so I'll give you a short answer and then we can talk after. Okay. Uh, for the most part, we don't do anything specific. I mean, the, in Cassandra, I think the only tweaking that I had to do was basically related. So Cassandra 1.0 has two types of uh, compaction strategies. So once you have all these, so mem tables go to disk, and they're written sequentially as S, S tables. And then the SS tables are merged, right? So the, and Cassandra 1.0 introduces two strategies for merging those SS tables. One that favors writes, and that one that favors reads. So the only tweaking was, does this particular deployment work better in a write-optimized way or in read-optimized way? So depending on the latency that you can support for the readers, it's, you choose one of the others. Yeah? For concurrency, do you use uh, threads or vectors? Uh, threads. Any particular reason? Uh, it made sense. Uh, it, it was easier for me to reason about. So we have these uh, little wrappers around Java util and current, and just an executor uh, wrappers. I'm not very familiar with uh, Aka, for example. So, but for the for the types of problems I was trying to solve, uh, using threads was, uh, and, and and I was more familiar with the Java util concurrent world. So for me, it was easier to reason about those constructs as opposed to learning this new framework. Okay. Yes? Uh, Cassandra, you
uh, data points. And uh, we have lots of custom dashboards, so all this had to be easily embeddable into graphs and easily linkable. So one of the big limitations of the old system is we just had sort of a flattened string as the name. Um, and a lot of teams were already trying to slice and dice this and doing aggregates based on regular expressions, which becomes extremely messy and it's uh, hard to scale and reason about. And there's no notion of common concepts, things like uh, no region, countries, uh, for us, things like devices, Xbox, Wii, and so on. Um, so one of the things that we wanted was dimensional capabilities and the ability to query that effectively. Um, and I'm not going to talk a lot about this, but one of the other big aspects for us is just when is data actionable. So we have thousands of machines that are reporting in metrics, and we need to know when is this data complete enough that we can take action on it, trigger alerts, um, and respond to um, that data. So then also on alerting, we need to be able to visualize it, how we do the signals, and then a lot of extensible functions. So I mentioned things like cold winters. We also use uh, double exponential smoothing, which is a similar forecasting technique. Um, and then just being able to do simple calculations, things like calculating a percentage across a cluster or some of their, or some of their aggregate group. Um, so one of the trade-offs that we did have when we looked at the data and the time ranges, most of our queries against our systems are for fairly decent data. Um, so we did bias it towards that in terms of the architecture. Uh, in general, most of the queries are less than a week. A little bit more than that if you include things like week over week, um, just used to see if the trend is deeper. Uh, um, so this is just kind of a high level picture of the system from a query perspective. Uh, it's we're able to hierarchically compose it, and so we'd have sort of a global endpoint where the user would go, and then we'll have different regions and breakdowns in that. So like for our regions they tip uh, typically follow Amazon's layout, so things like U.S. East, the U.S. Um, the U.S. West. Um, then we also have some like our Netflix uh, data center, which is getting smaller all the time. Hopefully, it'll eventually go away. Um, and then we can have third-party consumers as well. And in general, each region is an island, so that they're completely isolated from the others. Uh, but we have a similar view uh, within a region as well. So we've got a global point, and then we can go into a main cluster within a region. We can break that down into different tiers. So in our case, the different tiers typically represent different storage requirements. So for example, tier one might be a very short window for, say, real-time metrics that are getting updated every few seconds. Tier two um, typically has several weeks of data. That's a primary memory store that we're using um, for the vast majority of queries. And then tier three is a little bit slower response time, but it handles long-term historical views. And we can also wrap this and make other systems look and feed into our system as if it was just another backend. So one example that we've done this with is CloudWatch. And this allows us to integrate a lot of the standard Amazon metrics, things like ELB stats and uh, their instance metrics. And you can add them to the same graphs as all of our custom stuff, and you have a single view for everything. So one of the big requirements for us is we needed to be able to link this. There's all sorts of teams that have custom dashboards. So we needed to be able to generate uh, links and do some get requests for pretty much everything. And one of the problems is as we tried to get more expressive with this, you know, we wanted to have tags, dimensions, how do you break up and query this. We needed some sort of expression language that would we could easily express inside of a URL um, to make this happen. And if you're familiar with RD tool and other those, you'll know that they provide sort of a simple stack-based expression language. Um, you may have also encountered these, like if you use HP calculator for something in the past, they're they tend to be stack-based. Um, but it allows us to have a very simple expression language that we can use with a small symbol set. Um, in general, the only symbols are comma, colon, and parentheses, everything else is just basic characters. Um, it's really easy to extend. Um, and it works really well for having complicated expressions that we can embed with the URL and uh, making everything basically. Um, so this just shows a simple example. Um, in this case, we're doing a query where our name is SPS, the cluster is uh, Silverlight, 
and it's an and of those two, and then we're summing up all of the results. This is a more complicated example that we've kind of broken out, but it gives, uh, I won't go through everything, here, but it gives some example of like the red part is something called DES, which is double exponential smoothing. That's a forecasting technique that we can apply on top of the line to get an estimated value of what it's going to do. Um, and then we're computing like an area and things on the bottom. So this is an example of how we might generate a signal for an alert where we want to find out, oh, here's this big drop in the middle where we're having some sort of outage or problem. Um, and this shows just some like tweaks to it to do a slightly different visualization. So the previous one was showing an area at the bottom um, with the difference. And in this case, I'm just doing vertical spans to highlight where the um, actual value is underneath the predicted value that we have with the So it like gives you a little shot polynomial like that going there in red. Sorry, what? Looks like a shot of polynomial in red. Um, well, so what happens is DES tends to be fairly uh, tight on the balance, so we can have a sheer drop like that, it adjusts pretty quickly, and then you see it sort of bounce around after that's the prediction, so it's not the measured value. The blue is the measured value. Right. Right. Value in here, and the red is sort of our prediction. And if it's smooth or mostly smooth, you can see the red will typically follow it. But if you have huge deviations, it bounces around quite a bit. And there's some other tuning and things you can do to try and cope with this a little bit better. But this is just sort of a simple example of um, some of the things you can do with the expression. So your piecewise continuous curve will be better because you've got this huge uh, discontinuity and uh, almost infinite smooth rate change. Right, there's a lot of things you can do to improve this. Um, this is mostly an example of compression, maybe it's not something new. But, um, and then, sort of on the publishing side, we similarly provide libraries that can get used to send data in. Um, and you can spread that out into tiers um, and charting and that kind of stuff. Um, so now, change and talk about that's probably more interesting to the people here, which is um, why you can build a scholar on this. Um, so the main reasons that I like scholar for this is, so one, I'm a big fan of these sort of dry principles, don't repeat yourself. Um, and scholar gives you a lot of tools to help make that easier, so type inferencing, um, also things like case classes, is looked at Java beans, you'll know you repeat yourself quite a bit, if you're looking at things like the comments inside of it and all that, it's just a constant repetition that you have to do to maintain it. Um, and then there's also a lot of stuff you get for free with for case classes, such as a reasonable two-string implementation, hash code equals, um, and a lot of this can make uh, some of the simple objects much easier, much more reliable to implement, not to mention easier to read, um, and also things like mentions. Um, Immutability is default to something we really like, even with sort of the Java stuff, we tend to have file uh, marked everywhere and uh, try and do immutability as default, and it's much more painful to do in Java. Um, and also, since we are mostly a Java shop, uh, we use lots of the sort of platform libraries and everything else that is here from Java, and that works really well from Scala. On the other hand, uh, trying to create Scala libraries and using those from Java, in my opinion, is more or less awful. It's, you can do it, but it's really painful. Um, so in general, like for all of our libraries that we share around, unless it's just for our code, which is scholar based, we would do all of that. Um, the other aspect is DSLs. You see this a lot in scholar code. I'm not as big a fan of them as some of the others. Uh, I mean, like, you know, mentioned dispatch and all that. But, um, so I, I sort of consider it kind of scholar's version of PowerPoint annotations. So what I mean by that is, it's, it can be okay if used sparingly, but I, I think there are a lot of libraries and things where they tend to sort of overuse this, and it doesn't necessarily help with the readability or um, ease of use of the library, and a lot of times, especially if it's littered with implicits and other things, it can make it much harder to understand what's going on, to understand the error messages. So, And I'll point out that's purely my opinion. Um, but, uh, so in terms of libraries used, uh, we don't currently use a whole lot of the um, fancy Scala libraries. Uh, we use the standard library quite a bit, in particular the collections framework. Um, and we use Scala tests. Uh, there are a number of reasons for this. So part of it is just that we have, uh, we're mostly a Java shop, we have an extensive set of Java libraries in here, and those provide a number of core patterns. They also provide things like monitoring and metrics and 
uh, divided by default. So we occasionally adapt some of those call letters if we need them, um, but for the most part, we're stick, we stick to the standard library um, and then use some of the helper things like Scala and things. Um, there are a number of things that Scala does that I think uh, are very useful. So one example um, is you can often build constructs in Scala to help with things like correctness, make the code easier to read and uh, much less error prone. Uh, so just to give one example, this is some function where I'm doing something, and in a lot of our code, we instrument that code on metrics, so it'll come into our monitoring system and we get nice graphs, see how it's behaving in production. Um, and sort of an example, one way you might do this is the way, okay, I set up some sort of timer, and then I need to put a timing block around this. Uh, you typically want to make sure you stop and record the time as part of the timing block in case there's some sort of exceptional problem. But you can see this adds quite a bit of overhead to the method, at least in terms of visually, if you're trying to read this. Um, there's a lot of extra noise, and it kind of uh, hides. And also, it's expecting the user to get a lot right. They have to make sure, did I actually put it in the finally? And you know, maybe they already had a try catch, and they put something else in the finally, and then that could throw. Um, and Scala lets you create some simple constructs. So this is just sort of one example that um, we've added in here, and we can do the sort of try finally block. Um, and then we can express that same thing in a much more simple way. So it does, it's not as distracting for the person reading the code, and it's also uh, better for correctness because it gives you a simple statement, and the finally logic and all that is distracted in any way. Um, so in general, Scala provides some really nice abstractions, but this, these abstractions can also have a cost, and you have to be careful and make sure you know what you're doing. Um, or sometimes these can have a performance impact that you're not aware of. So one example that I'll just kind of point out, this is something that we sort of did uh, with using map versus map values. Um, and when I first started using it, I ran with it, it does pretty much what you would expect when you call map values, you get the result that you would expect. Um, but can anyone tell me what the difference between, well that should be in two on the bottom, but the map versus the map values in terms of the result that you get. Does anyone recognize or see immediately what the difference between that map values is creating a view. So when you do a map, it's going to be evenly evaluated and you get a new map with your transformation. And in map values, what you're actually getting is just a map that has a view on it, and each time you access the value is when it applies the function. So you can see here on the first, I did the standard map and I added a print line in there. Um, but when I access the value, I just get the value nothing down there. Um, and in the second one where I'm doing the map values, um, it's not actually going to do anything when you first do it, it's just going to create the view. Now in this particular example, I was running this on the REPL, so the prints you see on the first part are actually because it did the two string as part of the REPL, but if the, the REPL wasn't there and you weren't doing that two string, it would have iterated the values and you would get that. But what you can see here where it's printing the one kind of highlighted in red, is that each time you access the value, it's applying that function. Um, so this can be an important thing to keep in mind because if that function was expensive and you wanted to pre-compute everything as opposed to executing it on demand, that can have a pretty serious performance impact. Uh, so there's a lot of things like that where uh, it gives you a lot of flexibility and power, but you do need to go in and kind of carefully read the documentation to make sure you're aware of exactly what that's doing. And to be fair, they do put, this is the uh, descriptions from the Java docs. So they do actually tell you this. See, this is the actual implementation of map values from the map like uh, trait that gets pulled down. You can see that the important part here is this way you get at the bottom. You can see that they did the map and apply the function call each time. Um, so, another example that um, we'll point out is sort of match versus switch. So, like in the graphing code, we have a lot of things that are essentially looking at arrays of the map. And 
occasionally we had some statements where we essentially wanted something like a switch statement in Java over a continuous set of integer options. And you know, so this is something like what you would have in Java. And the first naive translation that we did in Scala was basically this. And it looks pretty much the same. But what we found is that we were getting horrible performance. And when we looked at the profiler, we started seeing all these boxing calls and other things. And if you look at the output in Java P, you can clearly see that, well, for one, you're doing all this boxing on top of the type, which we don't want. We wanted it to be using the primitive types. Uh, but also, if you look at logs, you see like 16, it's doing the diff equal. So it's essentially this chain of if else statements instead of the sort of table switch command to what it's about. So if you look at the bytecode for that Java version. Yeah, question, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's not going to compile down to a lookup switch unless you uh, enforce it with the add lookup switch. Uh, and yeah. annotation, but also, um, I mean, that's a JVM problem, right? Um, it, you can't do a lookup switch on anything except for an integer. An right. int. We'll get from it. Um, so, um, anyway, so this is kind of more what we were expecting where you have an efficient sort of table switch. And you mentioned the lookup switch, which is sort of similar, but it's essentially if you have non continuous integers, so you kind of like by a zero and a thousand where they're big out. Um, and then essentially you're just doing a lookup into that and then doing the go to on that. So, and this I think is what you were talking about, which is the annotation switch. And this is something that's really nice that they provided in there. And so, at least in this case, it's not going to fix it. So this, but what it will do is it'll give you a compiler error. So it'll explicitly tell you, okay, the optimization you were wanting didn't happen. Um, and there's a lot, there's similar things like there's a tail recursive annotation you can use to make sure you're actually getting tail recursive optimization. Uh, but then the question is, you know, so why didn't we actually get the table switch and what do I need to do to make that happen? Um, and in this particular case, uh, we initially just done it as val. And if you actually want the constant behavior um, from these, you know, I'll specify these as final valves. Um, and at that point, it knows that these are constant values and it'll do all the right optimizations. And essentially at this point, you get a Java and a Scala version which are very similar with the table switch. Um, you can see there are a few slight differences. So one of the things that is a bit odd is um, if you look at these orders, um, the Scala version is sort of doing it out of order compared to the Java version, but uh, it doesn't seem to make any difference on the performance aspect. But it's, there are some things like that where if you just sort of naively translate it, like say when the first version we had, um, and then you find that it's really slow when you start tuning it, and you kind of have to be aware of some of these things. So, um, all for the and there are any questions? Yeah. How many people do you find this micro language and this Google crazy or um can you can you find this uh, uh stuff in this language that you can get in your else? Mm -hmm. Um, so we're still rolling out some of this, so there are certain usability aspects, but um, also, I mean, even with the system that we had before, uh, RD had sort of a stack-based expression that was limited ways to express in that, and then that was spread over across a bunch of URL parameters, um, and then also the legacy one had like a whole bunch of really hairy things, like it used the plus sign as an operator in the URL. And plus is also used as a space representation in a lot of URLs. And so then there were like these hacks to try and figure out, well, it's plus a space or is it an operator? And, uh, so to that extent, it's much more regular. It's easier for people to kind of read about once you spend a little bit of time with it. Um, but also I think most users uh, generate it based on a UI as opposed to writing it explicitly. So it gives us a lot of flexibility um, in terms of just being able to express what you need. And for most users, they've been interact with it. You mentioned that uh, calling Scala code from Java is kind of hellish, and for that reason, your core libraries stay in Java. Mm -hmm. So, is Scala going to have to stay in a small corner of Netflix for that reason, or? Um, well, I mean, I suppose if more people were using Scala from the company, that would change. But um, uh, so I don't. I suppose it depends. Like, I mean, also, so when I say core library, I mean the ones that we share around. The company. 
to people doing Java. Like, we also have some libraries that are specific to our team, and since all of our stuff is in Scala, those are also in Scala. Um, so, yeah, I don't know how much that will affect the broader adoption. If you want to share your, <coughs> sorry, if you want to share your uh, Scala library, which is implemented in Scala, uh, to, to make it useful or usable from Java, why don't you just provide a Java facade, a Java interface with a Java facade, and you still can implement all, all the, you can still implement your library in, in Scala and still use all the magic. Um, so the primary reason is because, for at least our team, we only have one fairly small library that we're distributing um, in that manner. And uh, some of it, historically, was already in Java, and so we just kind of kept doing that. It's, you know, maybe if we were doing more libraries and there was a bigger volume of it, it would be worthwhile to try that. Um, but right now, so we just have this fairly small library that gets used for reporting some metrics that our team is managing and supplying. And it just, it seems simpler to just keep that small set of functionality job specific. You mentioned that there might be these public libraries that are might be hiding in code. Some of them might be really bad and you find them profiling. There might be others that you don't find. Do you think overall Scala code will be slower for that reason? Because you want to be able to find those cases? Um, well, I don't know exactly what you mean by don't find. I mean, if it's not a big enough performance hit that it's actually a problem in some way, who cares? If it's across the board, board a little bit here and there, but keep hiding. Um, so I'm not as worried about that. Um, for the most part, we've got a number of places where it's really performance critical and there's sort of a core um, aspect where we need to get really good performance and we just monitor that, we profile, we tune it really heavily. But then there's a lot of other stuff that's sort of around that and there the more important thing is, you know, is it easy to read, maintain, correctness, how fast can you get it out? And I'd say that's kind of the bulk. There's a fairly small set and we want to keep it fairly small where we really care about performance um, and on those even if it was Java and the other things, right, you're going to be performance tuning and profiling that all the time anyway. So. I had a question for the first talk. Um, I guess most of the people probably know answer to this. You talked about SBT, mm -hmm. type safety, and compile checking for your code. Mm -hmm. So I understand compile checking. What is type safety? How do you test? Oh, well. Uh, type safety is the um, <coughs> is is basically a difference between a, uh, a a typed and an untyped language, and so uh, languages like Scala, Java are typed. Uh, so the unique aspect of SBT with respect to this is that, uh, for example, other build tools like uh, and Maven in particular, the build language is XML, and XML is a very generic sort of language where Anything could be, I mean, basically everything's a string, so XML virtually has no typing unless you have a very rigorous XML schema. Um, is since in SBT, the build definition is, is written either in Scala itself or a Scala DSL, on, 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 which is basically, you know, is expressed as Scala behind the scenes, you can have a situation where uh, your build file you know, you, you can load it up into SBT, and SBT instantly tells you this is non-conforming. This is not a valid build file. You have, you're trying to assign this to that, and that is not valid. Or you know, you're trying to depend on this uh, from this task, and that is simply not allowed because of the way you have defined things. Whereas typically the case in, an, in a build tool like Ant or Maven or something like that, you actually have to execute the build and pass through that particular path to discover that, oh yes, I had a syntax error. So it, it just it just gives you a certain guarantee of correctness in the build file uh, before you actually do anything with it. All you have to do is just sort of bring up the build environment and it already lets you know, hey, you, you've got something that's just not going to work, so I'm not going to even try and do it for you. I, I sort of skipped over the Q&A session at the end because I was so hurry. If there were any other questions, I guess we Tackle Those are kind of like. Um, it's 10 to okay. okay. I'm just curious, you mentioned that you're using the force. I'm wondering if that's a start. 
<laughs> yeah. Well, I certainly do. But yes, so yeah. we're forced to what is sort of our enterprise repository. We also do a lot of GitHub. So all of our people are cool. bringing up the enterprise. Point point point. Point. So teams are migrating over to the next generation. I guess if there are no more questions, I'm just going to wrap it up for today.